Media gateways are a fundamental building block of voice communication networks, interconnecting legacy TDM voice networks with equipment from voice over IP networks. Found in service provider and enterprise networks, media gateways range in scale and capabilities, meeting a range of diverse applications. However, with increasing adoption of SIP and VoIP networks, what role will media gateways play going forward? Will they become obsolete and join the VCR in the dustbin of technology? Or will they evolve and take on new roles in converged voice networks? Welcome to the Future of Media Gateways, our 23rd monthly webinar covering technical, business, and partner topics to help service providers and enterprises build better voice networks. During this session, we take a closer look at the market for media gateways, some recent innovations, and a number of new use cases. We'll finish up with a summary of the media gateway portfolio from Telco Bridges and leave time for your questions. So let's get started. All right, some introductions. I'm Alan Percy. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Telco Bridges and uh, today's event moderator. And joining us again today is Mark Sanage. He's a Technical Sales Director for Telco Bridges. And thanks, Mark, for your contributions and bringing your expertise to today's discussion. You're very, very welcome. Hi, Alan. How are you? I'm, glad, I'm great and glad to have you here. Thank you. So, um, you know, we always we go through the uh, pre-registration list and there's always some new folks. So I would just want to spend a moment here and just uh, provide a little update on Telco Bridges, uh, a manufacturer of telecom voice over IP gateways and session border controller software for carriers and enterprise. Uh, we're an employee owned organization founded in 2002 with roughly 40 employees at this point uh, based uh, outside Montreal, Canada. Uh, um, doing all the development, hardware and software development is done in the uh, main office there in Montreal. Uh, we also have sales and support offices in Poland, Turkey, and Hong Kong, um, providing around the clock 24 seven technical support for, to our customers. So um, just a little bit there about Telco Bridges. So let's get started with some trends uh, in the media gateway uh, market. I um, did some digging on some of the analyst reports and came up with some numbers and some figures I thought I'd share with them here uh, to kind of tell you where we are in the, in the media gateway space. And, and first of all, um, a report from Markets and Markets um, said here the media gateway market has continued to be valued at about $2 billion in the US in uh, 2017. And by 2023, it'll uh, reach a 2.19 billion, um, and that's a yields a CAGR of about 1.46% uh, during the forecast period. In, in a nutshell, basically, it's rock solid, steady, continued uh, business in the media gateway market. Uh, no significant upturns and no significant downturns, but a good solid $2 billion market. They um, have this graphic they uh, share, which is um, just giving a brief breakdown of where the market is, um, primarily, you know, Europe, North America, and APAC are the uh, three spaces, um, with the um, rest of the world kind of pulling up the rear uh, off to the left there. A couple other analyst reports kind of reinforce that, the, um, the you know, DataBridge, market research, similar sort of results, uh, 2.3 billion in 2017 with a CAGR 1.6. Um, and uh, the verified market research kind of explains why this is the, uh, with a, a statement, the use of session initiation protocol uh, has um, increased worldwide because of um, which the IP based communication market substantially increased, which in turn enhanced the demand for media gateway devices. So we kind of stepped back and looked at our own personal experience, you know, from Tucker Bridges and my experience in the industry and Mark's experience in the industry and kind of came up with a, a little curve here that shares, I th we think what's happening in the marketplace, which is, you know, when we all entered the market in, the, in 2000, uh, the market was hot for one big application being toll bypass. Um, you know, being able to use prepaid calling, uh, enterprise toll bypass, uh, service providers using uh, voice over IP for uh, interconnection over long distances was really, really the hot market. But a lot of the applications of VoIP applications had not really taken off. And as toll bypass kind of uh, saturated the market, started to fade, we've seen now, you know, VoIP networks and some of the applications 
uh, re basically replace that part of the market. So the net of the overall market continues to be fairly steady um, and seems to be continuing on, you know, well into the future. And I don't know, Mark, you have any thoughts on this or? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think I, I agree with this. You remember Alan in the early 2000s there, you went to any convenience store, 7-Eleven, and you had could choose from like 50 different calling cards. Right. Uh, ev everybody was uh, in business and it was the hot thing at the time. And in, in our experience, or at least my experience, what dealing with service providers, you know, since then, um, voice over IP is being adopted more and more in the core of the service provider networks. Um, however, it still remains that, you know, they need to interface with TDM infrastructure. And it, it you know, it may be uh, TDM trunks, it may be uh, subscribers, customers that have TDM equipment. And I think this is what's driving the market for the deployment of uh, media gateways. Yeah. Yeah, it's inter interesting uh, transition. So you know, again, the market seems to be holding steady and uh, continues to um, progress. So um, let's move on. So we wanted to start with just a couple of fundamentals. We're going to talk about some architectures and some technology as we move forward. And I just want to get everybody on the same page here. So um, Mark, you help me. We're going to just step through just a couple of slides that explain some of the basic fundamentals of media gateways. And we're going to start with uh, the most simple, which is just the plain old integrated media gateway and some of the signaling and media that come and go in and out of it. Yeah, for sure, I can do that. Um, so we have two slides here, and really what they represent is two different ways in which you can deploy a media gateway, and it has an impact on the network architecture. So the first slide here is entitled an integrated media gateway, and integrated in the sense that the device uh, incorporates both uh, the handling of the signaling as well as handling of the media. Um, of course, the media gateway is there to bridge between a TDM network on the left-hand side and a voice over IP network on the right-hand side. Um, but in this specific case, on the media gateway is handling um, TDM signaling, such as SS7 signaling, ISDN, PRI, or channel associated signaling, you know, T1 CAS or uh, CAS R2 signaling if it's on E1. And um, the TDM media actually connects to the media gateway as well uh, alongside the signaling connections, which are typically uh, delivered over TDM. Then on the right hand side, it's the same thing. The signaling that's used is typically SIP signaling and the media is handled via RTP. So what, what I'd like for our listeners to remember from this is that in this type of deployment, the media gateway is handling everything, both signaling and media, and therefore it also incorporates a call routing capability um, because it must uh, be able to make decisions on where to send incoming calls, you know, on, on either side of the device. Then on the, on the next slide, we show a different architecture. And we've called this a decomposed media gateway. And this is one where the media gateway controller is separate from the media gateway. So what you should notice here in this slide is that the media gateway is only handling media while the media gateway controller is handling signaling. So just like in the previous slide, we can have SS7 signaling on the left-hand side on the TDM side, and we can have uh, TDM media typically on T1, Z1, DS3s or, or fiber connections on the media gateway. And then on the right-hand side, we still use SIP signaling and RTP for media. But notice there's a, a new protocol introduced here uh, or two new protocols introduced. Uh, those are H248, often called Megaco, and MGCP. These are media gateway control protocols that allow the media gateway controller to 
open and close media ports on the gateway and connect them together to bridge the media, you know, from one side of the gateway to the other. This, in this type of architecture, you could say the media gateway is a slave to the media gateway controller. All of the signaling, call routing, uh, call accounting is happening on the media gateway controller because it handles the signaling, um, whereas the media gateway is simply handling the media uh, and uh, media, which media processing is controlled by the media gateway controller. So uh, uh, Telco Bridges Gateways supports both architectures. Um, and depending on the network in which we're deploying, we can use one or or the other. They both have their advantages. Great. Well, that's a great overview. So kind of got everybody caught up here. Um, so let's talk about some of the innovations. You know, this um, the media gateway market obviously is fairly mature, but there have been some innovations more recently. And um, we thought it would make sense to just kind of step through what they are. Uh, and then when we get to the use cases, you'll get to see some of them uh, in play. And I know, Mark, you and I, when we talked about putting together this list of innovations, number one we thought was the um, addition of APIs to media gateways. And maybe you could just step through real quick. What does this mean and what, what's the kind of impact uh, into an application? Yeah, for sure, I, I can do that. And i just like to say, you know, these innovations typically come to, to life or become available uh, due to customer demand. You know, the customers face a problem and um, they come to Telco Bridges or other vendors and they say, well, what we can do to, to solve this? Um, and so the first one we're talking about is about these uh, APIs and what we mean by that is application programming interface. Um, what, we're, what it provides is for the media gateway to have the ability to consult or query or interface with an external system. And in this example, um, we're showing a caller name database. But I mean, that external system could also be a local number portability database. It, it can be a route server. Um, it can be, as we'll show later, uh, Alan, um, some uh, uh, call analytics, which can uh, be used to, to protect some networks um, and we have an example for that later but in this specific example just to give an idea um, there's an incoming call to the media gateway on the TDM side the calling number is as you see here um, the media gateway can while it's handling this call can query the external system via an application programming interface and this interface can be um, like a REST API, it can be SIP, it can use a SIP protocol as, a, as, a, as an interface um, to query an external database. It could be a, a, a database query, um, but the idea here in the example is to query the database and get the caller's name such that it can be display, uh, displayed um, to the called party. Um, in this case, you know, the name that comes back is Ace Hardware. Um, so this innovation allows the media gateway to be deployed in networks where sometimes the existing equipment does not have this ability to query an external database to obtain the caller name. Yeah, and as you said, there's lots of other things that could be done with these APIs. And conversely, the APIs can be used in the opposite direction too, right? To help uh, provision and configure the media gateway uh, and manage it remotely. Yes, that's right. For example, our gateways support a REST API, um, which allows it to be integrated with back office systems, like you said, for uh, configuration and, and management or what some people call like flow through provisioning. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, it's a huge, huge game changer. So all right, let's move on to our next, which is uh, media processing um, and how media processing uh, is now integrated into media gateway capabilities. 
Yes, uh, that's right. Um, so we discussed uh, just a few moments ago how Media Gateway is handling the media, um, sometimes with signaling, but sometimes without when we discuss the two different architectures. But given that the Media Gateways are handling the media, well, it's a good place to process media or to insert announcements detect tones, generate tones, even perform um, IVR. With our gateways, you can build uh, basic IVR menus and collect digits, uh, uh, even implement um, uh, conferencing on the gateways. Um, what's more is that there's often the possibility to record calls, either for troubleshooting purposes or in order to store the, the recordings. Um, there's another thing, Alan, that uh, uh, we didn't put on the slide and I should mention is that the uh, media processing also includes transcoding. Right. Uh, so it's the media gateways are often used to adapt the codec or the way DTMF tones are transported on the voice over IP network. Right, right. And the benefit of this, of course, is it, it eliminates the need for a separate device or a separate media resource function or MRF that would have to sit in the network um, with the sole purpose of doing, you know, minor things, you know, like ringback, uh, you know, playing ringback tone or brief announcements or um, some of those other things that, you know, just by leveraging the, the DSP and media processing built in the gateway, it um, I don't know, reuses resources that are already there, I guess is probably a way to put it, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly it, you know, and it it avoids the the deployment of a dedicated, you know, media resource uh, processor or media resource function. We we have the media processing capabilities in the gateway, and you know, to implement an, a new announcement or something like that, it's it's just a question of configuration. Yep, great. Okay, let's move on to talk about network quality. Uh, monitoring and of course uh, you know the quality of voice on a network is obviously very important when it comes to uh, you know a service provider or enterprise application you know it always seems to be that the most important phone call is the one who ends up with all the glitches in it and the trick is finding it you know what's the cause of it what's the source of it uh, and documenting what conditions uh, cause that voice quality to degrade and then be able to then make whatever network changes are necessary so, um, Mark, one of the things um, we've talked about is that the media gateway, because it's already in the media path and it's already um, processing it, is in a unique position. So maybe you want to explain this. Yes, that's right. Uh, I can do that. And, uh, um, and, and this is not a, a feature, say, that's specific or exclusive to Telco Bridges gateways. Um, but what we're talking about here is having the media, uh, the media gateway, sorry, measure the quality of the voice uh, on the voice over IP side and actually calculate a mean opinion score, a MOS score that becomes available uh, or available to be written to CDRs um, so the call detail records can be used to analyze over time or to um, store uh, the measured quality of a call uh, over time, but it can also uh, be used in making call routing decisions. So, for example, in the Telco Bridges Gateways, you can use this measurement of network quality to make a call routing decision. You know, very often these gateways are deployed in in inter international long distance networks, and if we're routing uh, voice calls across the globe, um, most service providers will have multiple routes to reach the same destination in Europe, for example. And um, by measuring the quality of these different routes by calculating the MOS score, while well, the gateway is able to take a call routing decision, say, uh, uh, live, to choose the, the best route, for example, to ensure the highest uh, quality of voice. Um, and this is something that's become available in media gateways for uh, for a few years now, but it's it's starting to be used in innovative ways. Yep. 
comes in handy. I think uh, uh, it's a useful tool. All right, next we're gonna start to get a little bit more complicated here. Um, and this is an area of the interface between the incumbent carriers and the competitive carriers uh, and the interfaces with their SS7 networks. Um, and so maybe Mark, this is uh, a bit of an eye chart, but I think it, it tells an important story. So why don't you uh, give this uh, an explanation here? Yes, uh, I will. So first of all, um, for the, the listeners here, notice there's no media gateway in this diagram. What it represents is the typical interconnection that's performed between two service providers. In the diagram, we're showing the incumbent service provider on the left and the competitive service provider on, on the right. And what you see in the diagram, the typical TDM interconnection, which is still used in many countries around the world, including North America, Latin America, South America, um, in, in Europe and Africa as well, is that the interconnection is, the signaling interconnection is performed uh, by a pair of STPs on the incumbent side, on the left-hand side, and a pair of STPs on the competitive service provider side. These STPs are signaling transfer points. They're like routers for SS7 messages. They only carry the signaling. Notice that the voice trunks or the voice circuits are at the bottom, labeled ISUP circuits. So typically, it, wherever we're performing a TDM interconnection between two service providers, we're using this architecture um, where we have a fully redundant SS7 connection via these STPs and we have the voice circuits terminated on a switch labeled SSP here as in service switching point behind the STPs. Um, and this is uh, forever how the interconnections have, have been done. Um, and, and now what we can do with Telco Bridges gateways is make this interconnection, let's say, not so much easier, but so much less costly um, and, and more straightforward. And before we move on, just to solve some of the alphabet soup, the STP is a signaling transfer point and, and its, its job um, might be worthy of some explanation. Yes, it's you can view it as an as an IP router. You know what what an IP router does for IP packets, an STP does for SS7 messages, right? When the the SS7 uh, you know uh, network is is widely used around the world, it signals voice communications, it transports SMS messages, it is uh, at the core of mobile networks. And uh, the STPs are, you can view them as um, routers for SS7 messages. Uh, you know, uh, an SS7 messages has uh, an origination address called a point code and it has a destination point code. And these STPs route based on these addresses. Got it. Okay. So this is the basic architecture. Now the trick is, the innovation is integration of all this. Yes, that, that's right. So um, what we can do with our gateways is we can, they can function as both an STP and as an SSP. That is, uh, through configuration, um, you can configure the media gateway to act as a signaling transfer point, you know, an SS7 router. Um, and it can also be configured as a switch, which is, you know, the media gateway function where it's bridging, you know, between TDM and, and voice over IP. Um, but what's interesting here and what makes it easier, you know, for the competitive service provider is that we can combine these functions into a single box so that the incumbent carrier on the left-hand side sees a pair of STPs and a switch behind them. And so they're very satisfied with the interconnection. It, it is a traditional interconnection, uh, which is 
robust, you know, uh, with fully matched SS7 links between the, the ILEC and the CLEC. And the CLEC, well, has a simplicity of, of deploying, uh, uh, so let's say, an affordable media gateway that can perform the uh, sophisticated STP function as well as the, the switching function. And we have deployed this this type in this type of architecture uh, in in many networks uh, around the world. And I could see from a you know for the competitive local exchange carrier, the benefit of this is all this ugly TDM gunk um, is just taken care of in one box, and from that point forward, it's all VoIP going forward. And basically, you know, the old world is is you know contained if you want to put it. It's just taken care of by one box and then you know at that point everything else is just void. Yeah, I, I agree with you, except I don't view it as TDM gunk. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready to start but, my show. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I agree with you, yes. It it, it simplifies the it, it simplifies the, the the deployment because typically you know, the, the CLEC or the competitive service provider is dealing with one vendor for the STPs, dealing with another vendor for the media gateway and another vendor for the switch. It can become complicated. This simplifies the process very much. Right, right. And then for reliability, um, as we talked about, um, there's the option of, of, of replicating these platforms. And maybe you want to just take a note about that. Yes, that's right. So the, what we're showing here is, you know, just two gray boxes here to represent redundancy. You know, it, it would be kind of, uh, it would be ridiculous to deploy, you know, a, a, a pair of STP functions um, that are, are there for redundancy and deploy them in, in one piece of hardware uh, and, and then you know, a failure can happen and then all of the sophisticated SS7 redundant architecture is, is destroyed. Um, so uh, what we do typically is we deploy uh, redundant devices and we actually uh, spread, distribute the SS7 layers across the devices so that if uh, the SS7 connection never comes down. Um, and we can do the same for uh, the uh, ISUP circuits there at the bottom. We can distribute the, the voice circuits onto the two redundant devices such that, you know, if something happens to one, well, the service is still up. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's move on to our use cases. And um... Uh, we're going to start with the big one, um, but to kind of set the stage for this, um, uh, we're going to talk about the, the network transformation. We're going to do a before and after, and we um, put together this diagram here showing essentially what is how most of the old legacy TDM service providers are structured. There's still, what, thousands of uh, service providers out there that are still uh, operate in this mode. Maybe just kind of step through the diagram here real quick, Mark. Yeah, sure I can. And, uh, and I'll add, you know, tens of thousands of switches are still in operation today around the world. Um, and uh, although this is a busy diagram, I'll, uh, I'll help you simplify it, um, view it in a more simple way. What we have in the middle here is a TDM switch. Okay, a traditional TDM switch. And these traditional TDM switches have a trunk side and they have an access side or a line side. And uh, anybody who knows uh, or has worked with such a, such a switch will know that these devices have uh, trunking equipment uh, bays and they'll have line equipment bays. Um, and What's, what's happening more and more, finally, I guess I'd say, is service providers are transforming their network and changing the architecture, migrating it to leverage, you know, voice over IP technology. Um, so what you can see in this diagram, we will maintain in the following diagram, um, but just please be reminded that 
you know, on the trunk side of the switch, we typically have TDM interconnections, you know, for international traffic, national traffic, mobile carriers, or just interconnect with, you know, other s- service providers like a, like Celex, which we just discussed. And then on the right hand side, we have the line side of the switch, which is delivering services to subscribers, to to customers, and we have all kinds of services. And and like I said, you know, we're seeing more and more of this network transformation where service providers are now taking the step uh, or maybe the technology is ripe uh, for them to start retiring these switches and transforming their network in, into the architecture that we'll present in the next slide. Yep. And then let's move to that. So this is after the transition is made. Um, and maybe you can just step through this. Yes. So if you uh, if you notice, you know, uh, the trunk side of the switch remains. We have t- typically very often what happens is, you know, these uh, TDM interconnections to international networks or other national networks uh, or other competitive service providers very often remain after the transformation. Because uh, they've I, they've always been there, they're reliable. Possibly that the price is correct as well. Uh, however, by transforming the network to uh, an IP core, uh, where we have a swap soft switch at the center of that, um, then we need a media gateway to convert, you know, between these TDM trunk connections to voice over IP in the core of the network, either using SIP or H248, as we've discussed previously. Um, Let me note that we added a voice over IP cloud there on the left-hand side, just to illustrate that the service provider's transformation to a voice over IP core network or to support voice over IP um, opens doors to voice over IP interconnections or SIP interconnections with other service providers as well as to communications platforms offering you know software as a service um, I don't know conferencing IVR that's implemented in the cloud and then uh, Alan briefly on the right hand side just to be thorough um, you know the, the line side of the switch is providing services to uh, subscribers the modernizing the network uh, provides a challenge in that a line gateway or access media gateway may be required. Um, very often some service providers, because they have the capability to, to do so, will um, instead try to migrate their customers uh, to voice over IP. Um, uh, which is represented using the cloud above there on the right hand side, and they'll deliver the services using voice over IP, maybe on fiber, you know, fiber to the home or fiber to the curb. Um, but I think I, uh, very often though, some some sort of uh, line gateway or access media gateway is required to maintain the traditional. Um, you know, services to the uh, the subscribers. Um, just in in uh, in conclusion, you know, this network transformation is happening more and more. We see the application for media gateways in this architecture. At the core is the soft switch that you know leverages voice over IP to say optimize the network of uh, these uh, service providers. Yeah, um, I, I and I think also too the trick is to minimize the disruption at the customer, right? That the customer's got a PRI and they're just chugging along, paying their bill, and everything's fine. The trick is the service provider when he does this transformation doesn't want to disrupt the customer, doesn't want to have to go to the customer site, doesn't have to do a truck roll. The trick is in the in the in the CO, they just want to move the the PRI over from one punch block to another um, and make it transparent to the customer. I, I think that's uh, that's exactly right. There's uh, uh, that is a, a strong motivation to in 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 a lot of cases to keep 
you know, the, the line side as it is, as well as the trunk side, yep. you know, uh, un until there's some gain to be had to migrate it to voice over IP. Right. Okay. Before we leave the slide, Jay had a great question, which is um, how prevalent is the use of H248, which we've got it here on the slide in this scenario. Yeah, uh, very, very good question because, uh, and, and I think the question says how prevalent is the use of H248 versus SIP, right? We right. explained at the beginning, you, you, you can deploy a media gateway without H248 and, mm -hmm. and it stand alone, it does its stuff on its own. Um, and I think my answer would, would be uh, it's half and half. Um, and it, and it just depends, I mean, in, in a deployment, in a service provider's core, uh, right. It, mm -hmm. I would say it's about ha half and half, uh, H248 is more prevalent in large service provider networks, whereas smaller service providers are using SIP, uh, in, instead. Um, but in many other applications, uh, and like you know, Alan, you're deploying on a on a customer premise or uh, to interface with a call center or other things that we're going to talk about, most of the time SIP is used. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the the role the soft switch then takes the role of media gateway controller, kind of from a functional standpoint to to manage those two gateways. I think that's that's, that's right. Objective, right. Yeah, so. that's exactly it. Yeah, and before we leave this, this is, you know, this is um, strategically, we think what's driving a lot of the activity in the marketplace. Um, we've seen a number of um, projects, and we've been involved in a number of projects in this front, and this is, seems to be driving a lot of the media gateway business going forward um, with, our, with our gateway portfolio um, facilitating a lot of this. So, good. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about um, another use case, which is um, SIP trunking to TDM customers. And this is a kind of a build slide here. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, we are seeing is SIP trunking providers, right? The new startup kind of SIP trunking provider. Um, they're in a situation where they can offer SIP services directly to businesses. And it's obviously been a very successful business, but they run into these businesses that have either legacy PRIs or in a larger enterprise or contact center might have DS3, OSC3 interfaces into their contact center. And you don't want to be able to have to wait for these businesses to upgrade those platforms to be able to sell them SIP trunks. And so um, the media gateways are deployed uh, generally at the CPE and the customer premise um, to facilitate conversion from the SIP trunk uh, back to the legacy interface for that particular customer, uh, facilitating the interface. And by working the numbers, um, the media gateway pays for itself um, quickly for the customer's perspective, they, you know, by the, getting the cost reduction of the SIP trunking provider, they see an immediate savings and those savings, um, you know, very quickly pay for the infrastructure cost of the, of the media gateway. And so any additional comments, Mark, on this? Yeah, I think I'd uh, just say that, uh, you know, these business customers that still want to continue to use TDM, I think it's, uh, they have invested in an infrastructure, an on-premise infrastructure, a PBX, an ACD, uh, a call center system, uh, right, with IVR and implements queues and, and stuff like that. And they're not willing, they're not ready to migrate it to 100% voice over IP. Um, so they, that's why they want to keep their ISDN PRIs. Um, it may also be that these, these customers, you know, I think it depends on the geographies. They have these ISDN PRIs. They've had their 1-800 numbers or they had the phone numbers forever. They just don't want to risk changing anything that could impact their, their business. Um, and, and I think those are the strong motivators for, you know, deploying a, a, a media gateway to, to convert between voice over IP and let's say ISDN PRI most of the time. 
I was surprised a few years ago, I got involved in a project with a nationally known muffler chain who had branch uh-huh. offices scattered all over the country. And he had um, what you and I would call a key system, but it's, you know, it's a modern, yeah. relatively modern key system uh, with basically zip ties holding the phones onto poles in the bays uh, <laughs> of the muffler shop. Yeah. And, you know, these guys have these dirty gloves on um, and they, you know, press line one to answer the phone or whatever, whatever it might be when their wife calls or whoever. And they take a lot of calls, setting appointments, et cetera, et cetera. And they just don't see any reason to replace that equipment for anything. And so to say to them, well, hey, here's this brand new SIP trunk to this old key system. Yeah. It's just it's Yeah, just and we're going to change work. all your phones. We're going to yeah. change all your phones, these great IP phones, you know, yeah. and then. It's yeah. just not part of their business plan. Their business, you know, what they're looking for is just cheaper phone service. And and that was one of the hurdles for that particular project was just, you know, delivering a low cost media gateway that they could terminate. Um, and of course they connect that gateway off of, I think it was cable. The idea was that the cable operator was delivering it to the customer. So yeah, there's some um, branch office and, and in, um, situations where that, that just equipment's not going anywhere. So anyway, Let's move on. So another area, this is a little bit more edgy here, which is the software as a service delivery. Um, and this is where, you know, here are a, um, uh, a host of applications here, I'll call, um, you know, messaging, collaboration, contact center, IPPBX, you know, CPaaS platforms um, that can run on these software as a service um, CPaaS environments like Twilio, and there's a dozens more of them that are out there that are completely SIP based. And when that kind of application um, goes to market, you have to deal with these legacy businesses that we just talked about. You know, they may just have PRIs or uh, contact center. You may want to use your messaging platform or use your conference calling platform. Um, how do you deliver those services to them? And again, the Media Gateway plays an important role in converting that SIP application back to PRI so that they can, you know, pick up a phone and, and dial an access code to get at the application, whatever it might be. Yeah, I, uh, and I think what the advantage here for these businesses is to have access to these cloud-based communications platforms, right. where where they can get uh, telephone numbers all over the world. They can quickly implement new IVR menus uh, and. Um, quickly implement dial out Mm -hmm. as well Mm -hmm. uh all of this is in the cloud there's there's no infrastructure um however you know if their campaigns are successful then they want to be able to take the calls into their business uh and uh have the callers reach uh agents you know that that are sitting in the business behind a traditional system that uses uh, TDM. Right. Um, before we move on, so I, so there's a great question here. The Roland asked a question about, you know, um, you know, with all the IP infrastructure that's being installed, maybe on the consumer side, uh, and you know, with the I- implementation of fiber to the business or fiber to the home, you know, wouldn't all this stuff already be IP based and, and already be converted um, with analog or PRI services uh, handled at the customer premises? Um, and I, Mark, I'll, I'll let you comment in a second. But what what yeah. I've discovered in some of the transitions that I've seen um, is is what we just had mentioned is that the business doesn't care how it gets converted, but it just needs to be converted. And the operator is responsible for figuring out what piece of equipment goes in there. And you're right, in some cases, the operator would have an ONT or some integrated device that they would plop into the customer prem that would do this media gateway conversion as part of an embedded technology. In other cases, it's a standalone separate box. Um, you know, we've seen situations where it's private labeled. You don't even know it's a gateway. It's just it's where you plug in your, um, your T1. Um, other cases, it's it's more blatant. You can see the brand of a manufacturer on the outside of the box. So, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, it, it's true that there's more and more IP infrastructure being deployed, say in the access network, 
and uh, there's there's more and more of uh, all IP communications towards the customer subscriber, but it it's still not everywhere. It, it's still not everywhere, and 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 the, the service providers, our customers, you know, run into situations where. Uh, it's just not feasible, you know, to to get a business customer or even a residential customers to to change. Right. Uh, it, it, that, uh, I think uh, I think that's what's happening. Uh, but it's true we are seeing more and more. Yep. Just looking at the clock, really, we probably need to get moving here a little bit mm. here. So. Um, so another, and this is actually an, an event we just talked, you know, a, a situation we talked about just a couple of webinars ago, which is, you know, dealing with the robocall and the, and the telephony denial of service attacks. Uh, and this is, um, you know, we again, we spent almost an entire hour talking about this, but in a nutshell, you know, the bad guys are generating these TDOS attacks, right? The TDM service provider just kind of passes the traffic along, doesn't, doesn't know what it is or doesn't care what it is, honestly. Um, but then as it's headed towards an enterprise on the right hand side, um, there's an opportunity to, um, through a media gateway, um, to use some of this API infrastructure that we talked about to do some analytics on the call and make a decision about whether or not I keep this call or uh, screen or ditch the call. Um, and with one of our partners, uh, TransNexus, we talked about this specifically using um, invites and, uh, and SIP response codes of 302, 503, and 603 to make decisions about where we route the call next as it comes out of the, uh, out of the media gateway, whether we send it to a uh, quick IVR for a CAPTCHA application or do we um, flag the call before or drop the call before it goes on into the enterprise. So this is an example of those APIs we talked about, um, and there's uh, lots more coming on this front. We're seeing more and more innovative solutions with um, you know, protection against robocall and TDOS. It's obviously a huge problem, and like I said, we spent an entire hour, and, and go back to our YouTube channel, you can find more on this topic. All right, so another one is uh, lawful intercept. You know, we, we um, uh, are in a unique place in a media gateway in the network, um, and have an option where we could um, potentially help law enforcement or in some cases are uh, required to by, uh, by legislation to um, be inserted into the call so that the bad guys on the left and the bad guy on the right are having a conversation and the FBI is interested in a copy of this phone call. So maybe just real quick, could you, uh, Mark, share how this all works? Yes, uh, very, very briefly, like you said, the media gateway uh, in this case is handling both the signaling and the media. So it is in a good place to perform the two functions required by lawful intercept. One is to collect call detail records. Um, that is uh, to uh, list the calls to and from the target telephone number to intercept. And the other thing is to intercept the media uh, where the, the law enforcement agency may want to, you know, listen in on the call or record, or record the call. Um, this is uh, uh, available in our uh, media gateways and it's uh, a matter of config configuration to turn on the lawful intercept feature. Awesome, very good. All right, so let's um, start to wrap up with um, a quick overview of the product portfolio. Um, you know, we have three different offerings, the TMG 800, 3200, and 7800, and Mark, just walk us through real quick the differences between these three. Yes, I, I will very, very quickly because the, the next slide is, is more interesting. Um, but uh, this is what Tucker Bridges Media Gateways look like. We have from left to right, you know, small, medium, large, TMG 800. So all of these gateways uh, run the same software and they perform the same functions. You know, we talked about APIs and, and we talked about call routing and signaling and they all uh, support the same features. The only differences between them is capacity. Uh, so they 
TMG 800 supports up to 16 T1E1 ports. The TMG 3200 uh, supports up to 64 T1E1 ports, but also 3DS3s, up to 3DS3s for North America or 10C3 STM1 um, for a fiber connection. And then finally, the TMG 7800, which is a large uh, media gateway that supports a, a high capacity with built-in uh, redundancy uh, where there's no single point of failure. There you go, Alan. Awesome. All right. Um, and then from a capability standpoint, there's a lot of yeses on this chart, I noticed. Yeah, and that's because the gateways, all of the gateways run exactly the same software. Uh, and therefore, they present the same uh, configuration interface, the same web portal, uh, the same REST API, and they support the same features. Um, so this is why it says yes everywhere. And what we're listing here is the, uh, the differentiated features of our gateways, and those are performance, um, the high availability, um, redundancy in a one plus one or N plus one configuration for when fiber connections are used. Um, the listing all of the signaling protocols that are supported. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned the beginning, you know, the gateway can handle the signaling or it can be controlled via H248. Then uh, Tuckle Bridges gateways can, can be deployed in both architectures. Um, we also support all types of uh, uh, vocoding for RTP uh, on voice over IP side. Um, and uh, at the bottom there, set of tools that are called TD analytics um, that uh, facilitate the, the management and troubleshooting uh, of the network just because the media gateway is deployed in it. You know, the, the call trace tool and the test call tool are very useful in, uh, in troubleshooting the, the communications on, on a network where the media gateway is deployed. Um, but, uh, before I turn it to you, Alan, I'll, I'll just say that uh, just because we, we mentioned it at the beginning and it's, and it's important, um, you know, typically, these gateways are configured via a, a web-based interface, a GUI, mm -hmm. um, which is easy to use. You configure the SS7, you configure the SIP, the call routing, but there's also a REST API that is also easy to use. We have many customers that have integrated the media gateway into their uh, operations support systems uh, via the API, and they were able to do it very, very quickly and very effectively. Good. All right. So I guess that kind of wraps up with some uh, a few key um, wrap up points here. So um, you just want to cut step through this? Yes, uh, I, I can say a few things. Um, Telco Bridges, uh, you know, has been. Um, building high capacity uh, telecom systems since 2002. Uh, our media gateways uh, were first, uh, became available in, in 2008. Um, we have since then uh, revisited the uh, hardware design and updated the, the design uh, in the last, uh, I think it's three years in order to ensure that we're able to provide the best performance. And in terms of performance, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is calls per second. Um, and this is what our gateways deliver. Uh, but the other thing that's important uh, when deploying gateway in such networks is the reliability. Typically the feedback we get from customers is that, oh my, uh, I put the gateway in the network and then I just forget about it. Uh, it, it just keeps on, on ticking and it's, uh, very reliable. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to say that. Great. 
and uh, cost of ownership. Yes, uh, that's right. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's easy to say that the, the, we have competitive pricing, um, but I think, it, and it's true, but I, I think it's more, more important to say that um, the gateways allow our customers to reduce their operational costs. The, and I just mentioned about the integrated set of uh, network troubleshooting tools that are available in the gateway make the life easier of uh, network operation staff. Um, they reduce the amount of time required uh, to solve, you know, reported problems, and the the gateway's reliability also contributes uh, to this. Um, you know, deploying a gateway in a network that requires less intervention. Uh, well, helps reduce uh, your operational costs. Yeah, and I think that that lower power consumption instead of having racks and racks of one use servers, uh, COT servers, I think um, the, the the efficiency of the DSPs and some of the technology, re you know, reduce the power consumption, which is one of those things that's like a like a leaky faucet, right? If you keep spending money on air conditioning and power, um, makes a big difference, and then. I think last but least, then um, I think is about the future of the of the products. I mean, obviously, Telco Bridges. I'm always um, amazed at um, the commitment to the past customers, but there's a commitment to the future. Yeah, yes, that's right. Um, the uh, so like I mentioned, um, the uh, the gateways are uh, new gateways. Uh, we revisited the design if I remember correctly, in, in 2016. Uh, and we have uh, made them actual, changed some components, uh, CPUs, and so on. So on. Um, and we're committed to the availability of these gateways. We know that our customers deploy them in their networks for uh, many years, um, and we're, we're committed to uh, maintaining these gateways and uh, make them available um, for many years to come. Uh, and it is true that uh, uh, we have a uh, no end of life policy. We'll maintain these gateways and make them available as long as we can. Um, and given that uh, uh, they were uh, revisited recently, uh, that is for many years to come. Um, the, the other thing is that, uh, well, the media gateways, uh, they, so they're there for TDM to IP, um, but they also, you know, as, as mentioned earlier, support other functions such as announcements, transcoding. They're an investment that can be, continue to be used in our customers' networks for, uh, for many years to come. Very good. All right. Well, that brings us to our uh, Q&A section. And I realize we are at the top of the hour and apologize. We've run just a smidge long. Um, but um, we do have a couple of questions here. We did want to slip in real quick. And of course, um, if you have to slip away, we understand. We've, uh, obviously, this will all be on the recording uh, for you to um, view. Um, you can skip ahead and just listen to the recording. But um, um, one of the questions um, that came in from a listener was um, sent in via email ahead of time, was asking about, you know, the differences between a signaling gateway and our signaling gateway products and our media gateway products. And if you could just give a quick summary of what the differences, not only in their function, but what um, the solutions are. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, and the difference is maybe not obvious, um, uh, but in fact, the name of, uh, of, of the device uh, says it all. You know, a signaling gateway handles only signaling. A media gateway, well, handles media for sure, uh, but uh, handles uh, signaling as well. A uh, signaling gateway is typically deployed in order to convert SS7 signaling on TDM to SS7 signaling over IP using SIGTRAN. And there are no voice circuits, like you know, vo ISUP circuits or RTP media connected to a signaling gateway. Whereas 
on the media gateway, as we've discussed, there is always media uh, because it's there to convert between, you know, voice between TDM and voice on voice over IP. Mm -hmm. um, and the media gateway can uh, often handle signaling as well, uh, whereas sometimes it's controlled by a media gateway controller. Yep. Okay. So a question uh, came in from one of our participants today. Um, would media gateway become obsolete when Volte or voice over Wi-Fi becomes prevalent and the media traverses the packet gateways? So yeah, sort of an interesting question. Would Volte, Volte itself is completely IP based and you know, obviously we assume a voice over Wi-Fi would be the same. Uh, so where, where, does, where does the conversion to TDM have to happen in those scenarios? Yeah, the the I think it's a very, it's a very good question, and I think m my answer will be that inevitably these Volte networks or voice over Wi-Fi networks need to connect to the PSTN, need to connect to the tra traditional telephone network, and there is so much TDM out there, uh, you know, for years to come that uh, it's, it's inevit inevitable that uh, a, uh, a mobile service provider uh, will need to use TDM to interconnect with some sort of network or some sort of device mm -hmm. um, that a media gateway will, will be required. You know, eventually, uh, Alan, when, when you and I are retired, you know, May, maybe uh, won't be needed anymore, but I, I, in my opinion, for years to come, uh, it's inevitable. Yep, yep. Um, one more question, and uh, and that's about Sigtran. So we um, uh, we continue to see a lot of traffic on our introduction to Sig Sigtran. Uh, video on our YouTube channel, uh, and I guess one of the questions that comes in is, where does Sigtran fit into all of this? Yes, uh, he, he, thank you for the question. Um, Sigtran is a technology or a standard uh, that's been elaborated in order to transport SS SS seven signaling over an IP network. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Sigtran defines specific protocols on how to take SS7 messages, encapsulate them, um, and transport them reliably, reliably over an IP network. So where does Sigtran fit in to this media gateway discussion? Well, when the media gateway is used to in interconnect TDM using SS7 signaling, that SS7 signaling can be delivered using SIGTRAN, that is, over an IP network, mm -hmm. to reach the media gateway or to reach the media gateway controller. And this is where SIGTRAN fits in. And our gateways support uh, the SIGTRAN protocols. Got it. Good. Okay, well, we could probably talk about, you and I could probably talk about this for another half an hour, but I'm sure our listeners are probably <laughs> wearing a little thin. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's wrap it up with that. And um, it looks like we hit the bottom of our queue of our questions for now. Let me just double check here, see if we got, oh, maybe we got a couple more slipped in here. Um, yeah, maybe just one quick question here uh, um, about codec licensing. Uh, there's a question here about codec licensing. Maybe just we can slip that in before we wrap up here. Um, you know, what kind of charges are there for deal with codex and some of the, you know, codex have licensing fees that go along with them. Yeah. So <clears throat> in terms of, uh, codec licensing, okay. I say it depends on the codec. Mm -hmm. Very often, uh, uh, our customers concern is, is with the G729 codec. Okay, the Telco Bridges in, indemnifies its customers uh, uh, from the the uh, requirement to pay uh, licenses to use G seven twenty nine. So there's there's no issue with G seven twenty nine, where there uh, may be 
a royalty to pay is for the use of some of the wireless codecs such as AMR, AMA, AMR wideband or um, other uh, codecs, uh, wireless codecs that uh, may need to be used. In, in this case, uh, I, you know, I have to say that these uh, licenses need to be paid to the in, in intellectual property holders, mm. and, and that's not Telco Bridges, but we can help. Okay. And one last question, the difference between a gateway and an SBC, and uh, again, that could be another whole 45-minute wow. conversation, oh, but just yeah. uh, and maybe in a nutshell, we can answer the question, is the difference between an SBC and a gateway is, um, while there's a lot of commonality between a session board controller and a yeah. media gateway, and it's, a, uh, it's dealing with SIP messages and routing and <laughs> other infrastructure, the biggest difference is the session border controller has no um, TDM interfaces on it and therefore it doesn't have to deal with um, a lot of the TDM protocols. Um, I don't know. You want to add anything more to that? No, I think, uh, I think that's exactly right. Uh, you know, in the context of this presentation, you know, we're talking about the media gateway use in a service provider's network. Um, you know, and how the media gateway is used for interconnect, let's say, right? TDM right. on one side, voice over IP on the other side. In this context, the SBC can serve the same role, role but no TDM. So it uh, has an interconnect role between voice over IP on one side and voice over IP on the other. Um, but the role is very similar. Yeah, great. Very good. All right, now we've reached the end of our questions and uh, we're way out of time. So um, uh, just a couple of closing comments here. First of all, Mark, I wanna thank you for sharing your experience uh, and spending some time with us today and also to the audience. I mean, you've been super patient. I appreciate the fact that you've been sticking around. There's a whole, whole host of you have marathoned this out. Um, and as I noted in the housekeeping, um, by later today or early tomorrow, we'll send an email um, with the links to uh, the slides and also to a recording of today's event. You know, be sure to share that content with others in your network who might find it useful. We do see lots of traffic on the recordings. It's great. I'm so glad you were able to use them down the road. Uh, and with that, I want to say thanks again. And, uh, from, and that's it from here. Wishing you all a really good day. Mm -hmm.